Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly celebration of service for the Bloomington Rotary Club. I am your current president, Sally Gaskill. Thank you all for being here, both those of you here in the Frangie Panny and our friends on Zoom. Yesterday, Americans celebrated both Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. In fact, late last week, President Biden issued two proclamations, one naming October 11th as Columbus Day, honoring the rich traditions of Italian Americans, and for the first time, a proclamation to honor Indigenous Peoples Day in honor of the native peoples and first stewards of our land. The presidential proclamation stated that, our country was conceived on a promise of equality and opportunity for all people, a promise that despite the extraordinary progress we have made through the years, we have never fully lived up to. That is especially true when it comes to upholding the rights and dignity of the indigenous people who were here long before colonization of the Americas began. And so I'd like to start our meeting today with a land acknowledgement. Bloomington Rotary Club wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Bloomington and Indiana University are built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Michael? Let's now observe a moment of silence. <laughs> Thank you, you may be seated. And Glenda Murray, can you please come forward? <laughs> Thank you, and it's good to see everyone in person. Many of you know that I try to keep up with the history of our club, along with Owen Johnson and, and a few others. With Sally as our current president and Charlotte being honored at the Rotary Toast, I thought it was time for an update on the women members of our club. You, rem you may remember that in 1987, Rotary International opened membership to women. President Bud Corr had been waiting for this and he was ready and the club was ready and immediately recruited some local women to join the club. Early members in 1987 included Vicki Tavanaugh from County Government, Judy Talley from the IU Bloomington Hospital Foundation, and Margaret Joseph from WFIU. 1988 brought four new women members who are still members. Kay Leach, Joyce Poling, Judy Schroeder, who's on, on Zoom, and Charlotte Zitlow, who's right here. And in Ginny Rose and Rebecca Wilson also joined that year. And Ginny was a member of our club until she died. Jane Hitchcock, Tina Swanson, Vitalia Farrow, and Judy Witt became members in 1989. And um, Tina is right here in front and Judy Witt is at the next table. I'm gonna ask you all to stand up in a minute. Uh, and we're going to <laughs> clap at the end, but you can clap individually. It's fine with me. <laughs> in 1990, and Monica was Kroner joined in 1990, although she almost she began joining in 1989, and Pat Gross joined in 1990. From those small beginnings, we now have 47 women who are members of our club, and that's 35 percent. So that's a third. Um, so that means 88 members, ma male members are 65% of the club. Thanks to Natalie for the statistics. 
So yay to Natalie too. And then I wanted to talk, talk, talk just a minute about the women presidents of our club. Judy Talley was our first woman president in 1993-94. Five years later, Pat Gross, who now lives in New York, was our president. Judy Witt, formerly of WTIU, was president in 2003-2004. And of course, many of you remember where she was assistant governor in 05-07 and district governor in 07-08, the first women the first woman from our club to serve in a district capacity. <laughs> I was honored to be president in 2004-05, which was the Rotary International Centennial Year, so it was a wonderful um, opportunity. Yolanda Trevino, who's also here today, and who is vice president for diversity, equity, multiple culture, Multiple, multicultural affairs at IU. She works in the office of the vice president. She was our president in 2008-9. And so, yay, Yolanda. <laughs> Susan, who was, Susan Bookout, who was director of Meadowood for many years, served in 2009-10, and she has since moved to Colorado. Mm -hmm. Joy Harder, who's online somewhere, um, was our president in 1415, and she taught us about fun. <laughs> Sarah Laughlin, who recently retired as director of the Monroe County Public Library, was president in 2015-16. Leslie Green from Stonebelt served in 2016-17, and Leslie's here today as well. <laughs> There's, there's Sarah over there. Ashley Wesley, you will remember, served as our first Zoom president because she, she never did get to host a meeting during her term in person. So, And Sally Gaskell is our president this year. So if I could ask all of those present whom I named, if you would stand, please, and be honored by the other club members. Linda, thank you so much for honoring us with your historical insights and for raising light on the importance of women in Rotary. And I have to add that Glenda Murray is the first person who got me involved in a leadership role in Bloomington Rotary. I can't believe it was in 2004 when she asked me to be the program chair, which I served for a few years. We have guests today. Susie Graham, do we have any guests on Zoom in our meeting? Sally, I'm looking and I'm trying to decipher. It's a little challenging. I know Nancy Borner is here. Nancy has been a guest of Judy Schroeder. Uh, the past few meetings, and I have to be honest, it's it's difficult for me to tell. So I would invite anyone who is a guest today or a host of a guest to please introduce yourself. I have a guest, David Smiley. <laughs> okay, that was Connie Chikalis introducing her guest, who is also our speaker, who will be introduced shortly on his own. Thank you, Susie. Um, I want to thank Susie Graham for coming forth and volunteering to introduce our Zoom guests so that Michael and I don't have to scuttle around saying, is there, are there any guests on Zoom today? Um, so thank you, Susie. Um, I also want to welcome Bet Savage, who's a guest here in the Frangie Panty. Bet is a guest of Michael Shermis. Thank you. We have a couple of birthdays this coming week. First, Jim, Jim Capshu, happy birthday on October 14th, Jim. And Dave Meyer, also here in the house, October 18th, happy birthday. Older and wiser. And we have one member anniversary of significance. Walt Kuhn has been a member of our club for 20 years. 
Thanks, as usual, to our producer, Michael Shermis, our Zoom manager, Joy Harder, who brought us done and continues to do, do, to do so, both on Zoom and in person. And I'm hoping that Martha Foster and Aaron Davis will serve as our remote camera and mic operators today. Martha has already been in service here. Um, Steve Engel, thank you for being our greeter. Glenda, thanks for giving the reflection. Susie Graham is doing double duty, both as our introducer on Zoom, as well as our roundabout reporter for this week. In fact, this month and next. Congrats to everyone, and thank you for helping us bring Bloomington Rotary meetings to you, both on Zoom and in person, week after week. Now, as a result of the pandemic, I have an announcement to make. We have, in fact, become a true hybrid club. We have almost as many people meeting every week on Zoom as here in person at the Frangie Panny. So the reason I'm telling you is in part so that you know that, both both those of you on Zoom and those of us here in the Frangie Panny. And for those of us here in the house, that means that you need to be sure to always use a mic when you're speaking um, and you want your voice to be heard by everyone because otherwise the people on Zoom won't be able to hear you no matter how loud you think you are here in the room. So thank you for paying attention to that. Uh, we have a Rotary board meeting this week on Thursday at noon. And finally, the Rotary Book Club first inaugural meeting takes place this Thursday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. All are welcome. Let me know if you need the Zoom link and don't forget to bring your, back, your book back to Natalie if you borrowed it from the public library through Natalie next week. I think we have a few minutes for some happy dollars. Is anyone happy this week and, and would like to give a few dollars in recognition of Teachers Warehouse? Anyone happy? And remember, you need to speak in the mic. So thank you, Martha and Aaron. Anybody happy on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah. May I? Hank, go for it. Okay, here goes. <laughs> Sorry. Binik and I just returned from a delayed wedding of our son, Mart. Uh, we were in Napa Valley. We were ha very happy that the wedding uh, finally occurred. It was originally planned for 10-10-2020. And they did get married on 10-10-2020, but they could celebrate only in 21. For that, I would like to donate $20 for the 2020 uh, to uh, the cause. Thank you. Congratulations on the wedding. Dave Meyer. I'm happy that I just came back from the West Coast where I saw my brother and sister-in-law who I have not uh, been able to visit for the last five years. And, and that's worth 20 happy dollars. <laughs> I braved it so far in COVID. <laughs> Wonderful news. Here's to vaccinations, family, and travel. Marilyn Wood. Well, I too have $20 because I'm very happy that we did the ceremonial groundbreaking for the new branch library on Saturday. Woo! Awesome news. Judy Witt. It wasn't quite as rich as before. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just returned from attending my first high school class reunion, and it will probably be the last. <laughs> and then I went on to pay a memorial visit to Jimmy Rose, who is a statue in Minnesota. And then I also went on to my college freshman dorm reunion, uh, where we spent a week together in Twin Lakes, Iowa. And the last, well, not the last, but the one that's down here, I guess, um, for Monica, because I'm so delighted to have her here with us today. Anyway. 
Anyone else on Zoom or in the house? Gus Shakalas up at the front. This is so Aaron and Martha get their exercise <laughs> while they're still digesting their food. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, not like seeing our Kai and I will be celebrating 90 years of marriage tomorrow. Aww. Yeah, I'm Raj. I'm afraid. <laughs> Congratulations, Gus and Kai. One more in the back of the room, Sarah Laughlin. And by the way, we've already raised 80 plus dollars. Isn't that easy? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm celebrating my new name. My, my two-year-old grandson has named me, and my name is Gone. She's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your happy dollars. And that's a hundred plus dollars for Teachers Warehouse. And with that, I'd like to ask Connie Shakalas to come to the podium to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, President Sally. I met a young woman this past spring who was getting her Bachelor of Science degree in recreation. I said, do you know David Smiley? She said, I've been trying so hard to get into one of his classes. He's awesome. The awesome David Smiley, a senior lecturer, has twice received Bloomington's School of Public Health's Trustees Teaching Award. This is his 10th year teaching at IU. His bachelor's is in recreation, park, and tourism management from Pennsylvania State University. His master's in hospitality and tourism management is from the University of Central Florida. David has more than two and a half decades of industry experience in hospitality, tourism, and event management. As someone who has herself worked in recreation for years, I am eager to hear what David has to say. David Smiley, awesome as you are, welcome to Bloomington Rotary. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to start out. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Susie Graham. And Susie, I have a question for you. Um, I haven't gotten any calls lately to play golf. So I just want to see, make sure I'm still on the list. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, the other thing I want to say is Connie gave me all the details for this uh, presentation today. And she left out two important items. One was, she didn't tell me there was a time limit. So if, you're, if you've ever been a student of mine, you know I can't present for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I mean, that's, that's impossible, <laughs> um, but I'll try. The, the other thing that she has um, forgot to tell me was I have to stand in place. I, I, can't, I can't teach this way. I can't present this way, but I, I'm, I'm bound by the parameters. But anyway, you, the, all the other information was there. Um, so I do have a confession to make uh, before we start. Do we have the slides up? Okay. Um, before we start, I wanna uh, just give a confession for the viewing audience, uh, and hopefully my wife doesn't view this. The, the confession is that I am actually one of the world's largest introverts. And so um, not generally prone to public speaking, things like that. And when I applied for this job at IU, uh, it was a change in my career. I come out of the hospitality and tourism industry. I was making a change. Um, by the way, I always told students that uh, you would change your career four times over the over the course of your uh, working life, that applied to my age. I don't know if you've looked at the current numbers, but they are looking at changing jobs more than 30 to 40 times. So it's, it's, it's changed. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so the other thing, uh, so the confession is that I'm this introvert and 
you know, my wife, when I come home every night, you know, she, she's been, she works out of the house. She's been there all day. And so she wants to talk to someone. And so I've been talking all day. But the good news is she thinks I'm a, still a really big introvert. And so I can still be quiet when I get home. So anyway, um, all right, so let's get started. My talk today is hiring in the post-pandemic economy, reimagining the hospitality and event industry. And so what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey. Let's make sure this is working. No, I guess not. Just take it out and put it back in. Maybe it got disconnected. All right, well, I'll depend on you. <laughs> all right, go ahead. <laughs> so um, first of all, I have to ask you guys, who's experienced stress over the last 18 months? One more. Just a couple? Oh, okay, a few more. Um, so what I wanna talk about is stress today and the effect on my industry. I came out of the hospitality and tourism industry before I got into academia. And so I'm going to ask you to take a journey with me for the next few minutes and, and kind of live the life of someone in this field. Um, anybody know, have a definition, a short definition for empathy? Yeah, Connie. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I want you to think about it today is to walk in someone else's shoes. Okay. So we're going to go through today and we are going to talk about the employees that have been spending the last 18 months in this industry. Now we're not working at all. <laughs> Hit it again. Okay. <laughs> all right. So when we talk about our industry, this is an industry that at the start of the pandemic employed over 18 million people. Uh, within two months of the pandemic starting, it was down to 8.7 million. So about 50% of the employees were out of work. I want you to think about your industry. Um, even though a lot of industries have been hit hard, has your particular industry, not your company, but your industry suffered a 50% reduction? Think about that. That's what these people are facing. So when we talk about what type of losses uh, they are experiencing, of course, we all know they occurred in hotels, restaurants, events, uh, pretty much anything that touches on the hospitality and tourism, airlines, cruise ships, they all were impacted uh, by the pandemic. And one of the things that was impacted, there were, there were two impacts. One, the people got laid off. The second is they kept them on, right? They kept them on and they had reduced hours. They had reduced pay. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but we've now reached an inflection point. The inflection point, I will argue, is this. People that run hospitality, tourism, and event businesses have to make a decision, how are we going to move forward, A, to get people back, and B, to have staff to service those people? Because all of us know, we go around town here in Bloomington, every place we go, no staff, right? Jobs are out there, but what's the problem? Well, we'll talk more about that uh, in a second. <laughs> so the challenges in hospitality, if we look at the industry before the pandemic, before the pandemic started, there were a number of structural issues in our industry to begin with. It was an industry that was characterized by uh, low pay, long hours, no benefits, no insurance, uh, staff were viewed as replaceable. Those were all challenges that were occurring before the pandemic started. Now that the pandemic is in place, they're trying to find workers. 
Now, one of the things that happened, I don't know if anyone is aware of how um, tipped wage uh, tipped wages work. Has anybody uh, ever had a job with tipped wages? So, so uh, Trent, you know, um, so d tell us what the Indiana uh, tipped wage is. It's still two thirty. <laughs> Yep. So that's an, you brought up another great issue. The tipped workers cannot predict from week to week what their income is going to be, right? It is a difficult thing to figure out. One of the things about tipped workers, though, in reality, and this doesn't always happen, <laughs> hopefully Trent had this experience, though, that the employer is required to make up the shortage between the tipped wage and minimum wage, which of course right now is 725. So if Trent was working, I was paying him 213 an hour uh, and he didn't um, make any tips, then we're, he's gonna make that 725 an hour. Well, that's tough to live on. We all, we all hear the stories about, oh, you know, I've worked this shift this day and I made $300. And that does happen occasionally. I used to have a beverage card employee that would routinely make three or $400. But that doesn't happen to most hospitality workers. There's a lot of challenges. One of the things that they are really looking for though is recognition. And recognition, of course, wages are important, but recognition is super important as well. Knowing that they are appreciated for the job that they are doing. Um, I just, whoops, lost a slide here. So I want to give you my example, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about me today, but this is an example. I was a member of the PGA, uh, Professional Golfers Association of America, for over 20 years. Um, and uh, over that 20-year period, I was the biggest promoter of the PGA. I would go to their uh, convention every year in Orlando. I, every person I talked to, I promoted the PGA. My, grad, my undergrad degree at Penn State was in the PGA uh, Professional Golf Management Program, so which is uh, put on by the PGA. So I, I lived and died PGA. When I reached the 20 year mark, I get this letter. It's a two paragraph letter. And it basically just says, thank you for 20 years of service. In the envelope at the bottom was this pin right here. And that's what I got after 20 years of being a member of the PGA. And I didn't get this delivered in person. I didn't get a personal thank you. I got this short letter, form letter, and this. People don't work. So what happened to me? Immediately, I picked up the phone. I called the PGA of America and I said, I'd like to give up my membership after 20 years. And and not only that, I still have a lot of contact with people who want to be in the PGA. You know what I tell them today? The PGA of America is the most expensive magazine subscription in the country. Okay. <laughs> so they don't know what, what they did by sending me that little pin. All right. So what are we going to do? How are we going to um, get out of this mess? And I know uh, employers and businesses here, they don't want to talk about money. But money in these people's lives is kind of very important. And I'm gonna to talk today for a few minutes about a starting wage of $20. And how do I come up with that number? I come up with that number because in reality, that's really where we need to be. And I'm gonna show you a couple of research projects um, that have been done on this. Cause I know there are business owners here or maybe on Zoom that are thinking that, oh, I can't afford to pay my staff that amount of money. Um, it's gonna cut into my profit. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that just for a little bit. Anybody know who this is? Anybody see this picture this week? This, this just fell on my lap. This is perfect for my presentation. This is Dr. David Card. David Card, is a economics professor at UC Berkeley. David Card, this picture, 
uh, was taken, I believe, on either Sunday or, or Sunday night or Monday morning early. He's in his office. You can see he's still in his bathrobe. Uh, and his wife took this picture. The lesson from this picture is if you get a call late at night from Stockholm, you want to lock the door because David Card is sharing the economic prize in uh, or the Nobel Prize in economics at this point. And his research, what he won that Nobel Prize for is he looked at the impact of raising the minimum wage and its impact on employment in the fast food industry. And so if you're not familiar with his research, I'm not gonna spend all day talking about it, but I just wanna give you some highlights of what he found and, and what the premise was. So New Jersey, where he did the research, was in the process of raising the minimum wage at that time. They were raising it 25% higher than the neighboring state of Pennsylvania. He wanted to do some research looking at kind of a metro area that kind of overlapped uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and see what the effect was in fast food restaurants on employment when they raised this minimum wage. And he found, he made some interesting uh, observations. First of all, we've all been told that if you raise wages, you're going to have to get rid of some people you're not gonna be able to pay those people or you're gonna to have to hire more part-time workers. What David Card found was that in actuality, it was just the opposite, that by raising those wages, they were able to hire more people. They were able to move out part-time people and hire more full-time people. And then the other thing that you might think about is what was the impact on the customer? You know, obviously, as a business person, many of you would know there's two sides of the equation, right? Revenues, expenses. If you're going to raise your expense, you either have to figure out how to raise revenue or you're going to do something, raise prices. So uh, so the, the standard thinking was, well, that's going to lead to increased prices. And what he found was there wasn't really a correlation. In fact, the uh, places that actually raised it above even that new 25% increase in minimum wage didn't show any difference uh, than the previous or the other uh, groups that didn't raise that. So it was a very interesting project and it's been uh, looked at uh, and done some different ways over the years. But this is just one example of a positive outcome from raising minimum wage. Now, that's not to talk about, um, in my class, we always talk about the multiplier effect, right? So the multiplier effect basically says that when people get money, uh, whether it's getting more in raises or in my field, when conventions come into town and they spend money uh, on hotels and uh, at the event, the money doesn't stop there, right? The hotel has now employed people to do that event. So they're paying those employees then those employees with that new money are buying gas. They're able to pay their rent. That money circulates. They're able maybe to have a little extra now and they can buy something nice. So that money keeps expanding in the uh, economy of the region. So again, that's something uh, that is going to come. Here is another example. And this one's gonna hit more to home. Switchyard Brewing Company. I hope most of you are, um, Familiar with Switchyard? I can tell you when I read this story and when I um, dug deep and understood what they were doing here, it, it blew my mind. It, it's a great model. So what Switchyard did, the owner of Switchyard was sitting there one day and he kept trying to figure out why is it that my tipped employees are all over the place in terms of what they make, you know? And what he found, first of all, was that there was discrimination, that people were discriminated against and made less tips. He also found, of course, as you could expect, that there was a correlation between the days they worked and the tips they made, right? And of course, tipping, uh, whether many people acknowledge this or not, puts the server in a position of inferiority. They have to cater 
to the whims of the customer and basically do whatever they demand, right? And they have no way to push back, even to the point where customers come in, they're wearing or not wearing a mask. They can't even push back on that, even though it's a, uh, a law or a, on the books here in the county. Uh, they can't do that because they're, they're in that position. So the owner of Switchyard was looking at this and he's like, and, and of course, all the other things that typically go with uh, hospitality workers, no insurance, no time off, blah, blah, blah. This, this uh, owner looked at it and he decided this is not right. You know, I can't hire people right now because no, you know, jobs are all open and no one's applied because they had that experience prior to the pandemic, right? So now they don't want to come back now have the same experience, but also have to worry about getting COVID, right? So what he decided to implement was he set a starting minimum wage for new employees there at $18 an hour. He, he then, bless you, then provided a number of benefits. He's provided them access to mental health care and emergency health care. Uh, he has provided uh, uh, unlimited vacation time, you tell me what you need, you take it. He has provided uh, access to um, other types of benefits. There are a number of things that he has provided his employees. Take a guess at what happened after that. First of all, he got people to apply, right? Got people to apply. And as of today, my most recent uh, research on them, they haven't lost one employee. I don't know if you know what the turnover ratio is in the hospitality industry, but pre-pandemic, it was 80%, which means if you were my employees, one year from now, we hold this meeting, only 20% of you are going to be here. But now you know what the number is? During, you know, during this past year, what the number was? 130%. So I got to get rid of all you guys. I have to hire 30% more and they're going to be gone too by next year. Here's a business that has none since he implemented the program. Unheard of. So if they've implemented that and they're able to be staffed, because I can tell you staffing <laughs> right now in the hospitality industry, staffing is the biggest correlation to businesses making money. The IU, we see that every day. We got a Starbucks up here that I used to go to every day. Starbucks. It's only open like three days a week now because there's no staff. The other restaurants, students can't access because there's no staff or it's very limited hours. So we have to solve this problem. And Switchyard gives us an idea. Let's shift gears and let's talk about events because it's a little different in events in the event side of my industry in fact the events uh people are still telling you that uh over the next um eight years or so they're projected uh, still at 11 percent annual uh compounded annual growth rate so things are still decent in the event industry but it was a challenge at the start right because they went from doing all live events to doing zero, right? They were shut down immediately. And so like restaurants, like hotels, they had to figure out what are we gonna do? And so they thought about it. And the first thing they came to is, hey, we're having to help all these people with Zoom, right? Maybe we could do virtual meetings. Well, that wasn't that easy because I'm an industry professional. And if you would have asked me five years ago, are you gonna to go to a meeting on Zoom? You know, we can save you time. You know, you don't have to leave your office. You could do the meeting on Zoom this week. You know, I would have looked at you like, have you been drinking? It's, it's still not, you know, it's barely new, you know? No one, no one in my industry would go to a virtual meeting. Are you kidding me? But what's happened in the last 18 months? And very early on, events figured out how to make virtual meetings and then how to make better virtual meetings, right? So now 
Um, anybody uh, experience this? Ever have this experience? Go to a concert and, and take in the concert in the mosh pit? Could you even imagine doing that today? I mean, first of all, everyone will have their mask on if they let you <laughs> get that close. But so event organizers had to come up with something. What are we going to do? Well, here's what they did. Look at that. I don't know how well you can see that on Zoom or in the back there, but I'll describe it to you. What you're looking at here is a live concert at a drive-in movie theater. Everyone is in their cars. Some get out of their cars and start dancing, of course. But so the music is coming over regular speakers like an outdoor concert, but it's also being piped through their uh, radio in their cars. And this is where the first pivot of events went. We're gonna do, we're gonna figure this out, how to keep the people the audience safe while we still perform live. And, you know, some of you might look at this and say, oh, I mean, who's gonna do something like that? Well, Garth Brooks over the past summer did an event live at a drive-in theater. They simulcast it at 300 other theaters. And he had an audience for that one event of 350,000 people. Think of that, 350,000 people seeing an event, pretty much live, okay? So the event industry has figured out how to pivot. Now there's other kinds of events. We're talking concerts here, but there's conventions, right? Many of you might go to conventions for your is industries or you know, societies or whatever. And so again, conventions were shut right down. And the question was, how are we gonna do that? Because you have things like this, right? People are meeting, they're all sitting close together. Um, so how do, we, how do we get out of this to, to get that back working? And so virtual comes in here. I don't know how well you can see this, but you're not looking at a picture of a uh, lobby at a convention center. You're looking at a picture of a lobby of a convention center with avatars in there. And so people were going to meetings a while back, creating an avatar, paying to go to the meeting and having the opportunity to meet in the lobby, connect by chat with their another avatar who was their friend who they would have seen at the meeting. And all of this just keeps transpiring like you're there in person. And then you go from here to the actual events. So right here, I'm sitting in the back here, probably in the third row, and I'm watching this event like you're watching me, but it's all virtual. But when the presenter presents on screen, you could see that on your screen. And so this is what they were able to do. Now, again, this is the meeting that I told you five years ago, you'd be out of your mind. I'm never going to this. But because they've been able to develop this technology, event planners have figured something out. Events are coming back. The industry is coming back. I don't know if you've seen some of the latest numbers. I mean, hotel occupancies, across the US right now are about 70%. They've come way back. They were about 10% at one point. Um, air, airlines are full. I don't, anybody flown lately? Was it full? Yeah, it was full. <laughs> People are flying. People are traveling. Um, but you are always, uh, even before the pandemic, you would have people that could not come to a convention for whatever reason. Maybe they couldn't come to the convention because of the cost maybe the time away, maybe they're, maybe they're scared to fly and it was too far to drive. There are a lot of different reasons. And so now the industry as it's coming back is morphing to this hybrid uh, delivery model. And so now conventions are reopening. You can go to conventions now live. You can pay them to go to your old conventions just like you always used to, but they also, have the Zoom or the virtual component of the meeting. And you know what's happened? Producers of events have figured out, well, I was charging 600 to come to my meeting, 
plus that attendees paying airfare, hotel, blah, blah. And this person, they're not coming, but they still are interested in attending virtually. I'm going to charge them $300. And now this has opened up an entire new audience for them. I know we're running out of time, right? <laughs> I, have, I basically have two slides left. So what does it mean to employers? Because I, I want to kind of tie this up in a bow. Um, there was a paper, Good Job Solution, Good uh, and, and this professor wrote about what he saw the difference between good and bad companies. And you all can imagine what they are. But basically it comes down to the fact that they treat employees like they are part of the management. You know, they let them in on decisions. Bad companies don't. They offer them benefits. And so all of these things are going to be what this requires. But there were a bunch of new jobs created by the pandemic. Virtual techs, right, didn't exist. Participant engagement managers, music creators, health ambassadors. You know, my particular program, Tourism, Hospitality, and Event Management, happens to be housed in our new department of health and wellness design here at IU. Now I have the opportunity to take the skill set of my hospitality people and put them into clinical and hospital settings. And that's going to be a new and exciting career for them. So the future looks bright. I hope that uh, I was able to show you uh, what they've experienced, but we're coming out of it. And I look forward to the future. I look forward to more people coming up with Switchyard's model, but thank you for listening. I'm sorry? No. David, thank you so much. Um, in honor of your um, talk today, we will be giving a donation to Wonder Lab. Um, and we have time for maybe one question. Do we have one either on Zoom or here in the audience? I'll stay around if we have questions. And David will stay around for those of us here in the Frangie County. Um, Connie Shikalis, can you please wait and speak in a mic? <laughs> here comes Aaron. <laughs> Well, obviously, at the start, they had the, um, you know, the unemployment. Now, I will say that for hospitality workers, unemployment is hard to file for because their, their wages being so, so different over the year, they have to show a year's worth of wages. And so there are some minimums. And so in some cases, it's difficult to prove that. Um, so at this point, though, some of them are out of work. But when we get back to that inflection point I talked about, this is where I think we are. I think they're going to wait. I think they'll take the jobs like Switchyard, and they're going to wait out the rest of the jobs. But people, but employers are recognizing that. If, if you drive around right now and you want to work at Domino's Pizza, Domino's Pizza, they're going to pay you $15 an hour. Okay, so we're getting closer to my 20. Um, you know, Arby's just opened. They, they had a sign last week, said 13. Two days later, they bumped it to 14. Keep going, Arby's. So, um, but what employers are going to benefit from this is they're going to get employees who are vested, right? If, if you're paying me $20, then I'm going to be vested. Just to give you one example, Quick Trip is a convenience store in Pennsylvania or on the West Coast, I believe. They have 700 franchises in 11 states. They, uh, when they started hiring, they give you cognitive tests and all kinds of personality tests. They hire the people and then 20% of them don't make it through training. But the other 80%, they start them at 40,000 a year. Thank you so much. Great question, terrific answer and insightful program. Come back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. So in closing, we are building up momentum to the Rotary Toast because next week's speaker is Wendy Goodlett, Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity here in Monroe County. And her topic is called Honoring Charlotte, How Her Support of Habitat Aligns with Rotary's Mission. I look forward to seeing you all next week. How many weeks until we honor Charlotte at the Rotary Toast? 
three. Three people. Okay. Rotarytoast.com to make your reservation. Let's finally close our meeting by reciting the four-way test together plus one. Of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendship? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all? And fifth, is it fun? Thank you all. Sorry, I had to come.